Thank you, Brother Joe. Take your Bible, go to the book of James, and find chapter 4, and uh, we'll continue going through the book of James. This will be the 18th message in our series, and we're a little way through chapter 4. I've been looking at the book a little bit. There's probably, oh, good 15, 10 or 15 messages left in the book. And I've enjoyed this study through the book of James. It's the Proverbs of the New Testament. But it's also a book that keeps us accountable. It's where the rubber meets the road. The theme of the book is a talk that walks. It's not just declaring we have faith. It's displaying that we've been saved by the grace of God. And as we especially have gotten into chapter 4, which is a dutiful faith, a submissive faith, our faith was developed in chapter 1. Chapter 2 was a displayed uh, faith. And uh, then we get through uh, chapter 3, and now here we are in chapter 4. And we're dealing with areas of the Christian life that, um, well, they kind of nitty-gritty. I mean, it's, it's right down Main Street Christianity, and it's stuff that... A number of God's people, myself included, would probably say, well, Brother Sam, I didn't realize I had a problem with that. I mean, it talks about our temper. It talks about our argumentative uh, condition. It talks about our strife. It talks about our lack of prayer and our haughty spirits and our me-first attitudes. And it talks about our associations, our fellowship and uh, friendliness uh, with the world. I, didn't, I don't think, did I say disciplined faith? I don't know if I said that. That's what chapter 3 was, was a disciplined faith, how it, it's disciplined, just like military. It, it gets regimented. We have to control with the help of the Spirit, the flesh. And now here we are in a dutiful uh, faith. Uh, last message was a little bit rough there, talking about our friendship with the world and being an enemy of God. This one here. Uh, I fear is the same. I don't fear it, but I know it is. I, uh, we did the air conditioning work today, and I appreciate Miss Donna. I hope you all pray for her, and love. what a great asset to the church she is, and uh, a blessing to me. She does more um, than I ask her to, and she does it with a smile, and she's a tremendous blessing. She sat here all day because I had a number of things I needed to take care of, and I appreciate that, but I told her they were just bong, banging and bonging and getting the air cast. I said, I got to go home and study. Trixie's not even that loud, and so I have studied in my recliner today, and as I was going over this, a very famous, familiar portion of Scripture, uh, I was greatly convicted, and it all stems from a quote that uh, Dr. Green gave me. Uh, he said it many times in preaching, but when he made it personal, it really stuck with me. So James chapter 4, I want us to pick up our reading in verse number 6. And we'll read down through verse number 10. The Bible says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace. To the humble. I want you to hold your finger right there and I want you to take your Bible and turn to 1 Peter. And I want you to find chapter 5 where the Bible says through Peter, Likewise ye younger submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Notice he said right here, Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. This is what Jesus said in his earthly ministry in Matthew 23. He was talking about the greatest and the least, if you remember. And he said, if you're great, then you're a servant. Boy, don't we need that reminder today. Greatness is not found 
in just merely being capable of being an athlete or being sharp or being wealthy or being outgoing or being attached to someone else by way of DNA. He said the greatest to live is the servant. To be great is to be a servant. He said really those that are last are the first. And those that are first are the last. Remember he said that. But then he also said, Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. But then he said this, And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Is that not what he says here? He said, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. There is one of the key verses in this chapter, if not in all the books. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Do you know what he's actually saying right there? Because if you look in verse number 6, he's talking about us. He said, God resisteth the proud. But notice this, submit yourselves. You would say, Brother Sam, in verse number 6, the word your is not there. The word yourself is not there. So isn't he just making a general comment, a general statement that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble? That might be, but if you get to verse 7, it gets a little specific, doesn't it? Where he says, submit what? Yourselves. So he's attached the two verses. You and I are either proud, stubborn, self-willed, and behaving on our own, or we are sold out and surrendered and submitted to God. So he's saying if you live for yourself, you're proud, and God's going to bring you down. He said, however, if you'll submit yourself to God, and you'll live for Him, and you'll put yourself under the yoke of His bondage, and by the way, did He not say, my yoke is easy? and my burden is light. You place yourself under the control of God. Submit yourself, he said, therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, that's interesting. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Now, do you notice the period? That's a statement on the heels of verse number 6. But then notice the next statement, all in the same verse. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You understand you can't resist the devil if you're not submitted to God. Doesn't the Bible say walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh? Did not Jesus say you are servant to the master you decide upon? No man can serve two masters. So either we're in submission to God or we are in submission to the devil. He says, however, if you'll get in submission to God, then he will give you the grace that you need. Notice what he said. Uh, He said he giveth more grace. He'll give you the strength and the grace that you need to be able to resist. Now that word resist, also means to withstand. And does not the Bible talk about that in Ephesians 6? Put on the whole armor of God, and does he not say after the armor is listed, and having done all to stand? He talks about how you're able to quench the fiery darts of the devil. When you're in submission to God, it is then and only then you have strength to stand up to the devil. But until you and I get under the yoke of our Lord, we'll be under the yoke of our flesh. And we won't resist or withstand the devil. We'll give in to him. The Bible then says, and he will flee from you. You know what else you could write in the margin of your Bible is that text of Scripture. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. 
but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that she may be able to bear it. Did he not say in the garden of Gethsemane to Peter, James, and John, the inner three, as they fell asleep in prayer, did he not say pray lest ye enter into temptation? You and I have no power to withstand the devil. You and I in the flesh cannot handle the fiery darts of the wicked one unless we are in submission to God. I think we're learning in James the great reality is you cannot serve two masters. He's made it very plain in this entire book. He's made it very plain you're on God's side or you're not. You're walking with God or you're not. You're doing, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, be a doer of the word and not a hearer, or you're not. There is no ambiguity in this book, is there? I'm not finding any gray area. I'm finding black and white theology. I'm finding uh, pedal to the metal theology. I'm finding the kind of theology in the book of James and the kind of practical Christianity, now listen, that separates those that are completely committed and those that show their faith by their works, and those that say they have faith, but they don't back it up by their works. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's a text of Scripture that I meant to give you here. Let me turn to it as quickly as I can. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, I love it when the pages stick together, don't you? Proverbs chapter 3, it's verse number uh, 34. Remember James said, wherefore he saith, did, 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 did you see that there? Wherefore he saith, verse 6, you ought to write Proverbs three thirty-four, which says, surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. So that's a direct quote that James is making from Proverbs. What is James? The Proverbs of the New Testament. He's quoting Solomon. And the 12 tribes scattered abroad would know this text of Scripture that God does not like pride. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look. What was the number one reason that caused the devil to try to exalt himself above the throne of God, pride. Pride. Now notice this, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. That's an absolute definitive statement we'll deal with in a moment. I'm glad about it. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So the first part of that verse is a declaration. It is a statement. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. But then you get into the back half of the verse, and end of verse 9, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So you have in the first part of the verse a, a statement of declaration, a statement of truth. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Do you understand that tonight? Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. However, the back half and the next two verses give you the steps that afford the ability to draw. I said the message tonight was based on a statement that Dr. Green made to me one time. In his counsel to me, I missed him greatly. He looked at me and he said, Sam, he always called me Sam. He would always say something like this, now I love you, you know that I love you. And every time he would make a comment like that, I would know I'm in for a whooping. I'm in for his opinion and his rebuke. And he always gave it in love, but he gave it. And he remember the first time I was really struggling spiritually that he was aware of because I 
uh, had never quite confided in him this way before, but he was helping me through my first depression in 2011. And this is what he said to me. He said, son, he said, I'll tell you what God is doing. God is resisting you that he might give you grace to come to him. In other words, son, you're cocky. You're arrogant. You're full of Sam. And there's no room for the Savior. If you'll empty yourself of Sam, God might be able to use you. What do you think about that? Is he not right? He resists the proud. At that particular point in my Christian life, God was resisting me. You know what that word resist the proud means? You can't approach me. I think sometimes we have this idea that when God resists the proud, he just doesn't bless them. He just doesn't shine upon them. They're just like a nuisance to him that he swats away. But that's not what the word resist means. In fact, does not the word resist means a little bit of conflict. It means a little bit of adversarial. It means a little bit of hand up. You can proceed no further. Has it ever dawned on you that Christians can get to the place in their life where the very God who saved them that said, come unto me, can also say, stay away from me? That's what happens when we're lifted in pride. He resists the proud. Pride cannot approach the throne. Not only is there no ability to do it, there's no access to do it. He won't allow us to do it. Aren't we foolish tonight? How, how often have you and I thought we're making headways with God when in reality we're getting nowhere with God because of our pride? So he says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Dr. Green then said this to me. I said, Dr. Green, I love you and respect you and do you ever think I can walk with God like you do? I said, I'm not trying to elevate you. I'm not trying to make a God out of you. I'm not trying to look at you as some superhuman. I said, I just respect your walk with God. To which he said, well, of course you can. He said, there's nothing special about Don Green. He said to me this phrase, Sam, you're as close to God as you care to be. Did you hear what he said? Brother Sam, I don't feel close. Brother Sam, there feels like there's a space. Brother Sam, I, I just don't feel as close to God as I once did. Well, that's not on God's side. That lack of closeness and that distance is on man's side. You are tonight, listen to Brother Sam, you're as close to God as a teenager, as a young adult, as an adult, as a senior citizen, single, married, widowed, widower, it's servant, layman, it doesn't matter who you are, saved by the grace of God. You are as close to him tonight, not as he wants, but as you want to be. Drift is common in the Christian life. That's what James is dealing with. He's telling the 12 tribes scattered abroad, you're going to struggle with the flesh. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Talks about our tongue. Talks about our lack of Christian activity, knowing to do good and doing it not. He talks about our strife and our conflict and our lack of prayer. And if you go through the book of James, point after point, verse after verse, admonition after admonition is just trying to get the Christian to live the daily Christian life. Distance and drift is common in the Christian life. It's not if, it is when you and I are going to feel we are not as close as we once were. It's common. We get hot, we get cold. Didn't God say that in Revelation? I'm tired of lukewarm. I'd rather you be hot or cold. Talks about our spiritual temperature. There are times you feel like you could charge hell with a squirt gun and then there are times you'd just rather leave it alone. 
There are times you can't wait to pick up your Bible and read 20 chapters and then there are times you pick it up and try to get through two verses. There are times you pray and then you look at your clock and it's been an hour and then there are times you go to bed and say, I didn't even pray. It's part of the Christian life. I'm not saying it's acceptable, but I do want to encourage you it's normal. We are human, we are fleshly, and drift is common in the Christian life. We all go through seasons of closeness and distance. We do. Did Peter not show us that? Peter shows us what it's like one day to walk with God, the next day to follow him afar off. David shows us this. Abraham shows us this. Moses shows us this. His own half-brother James in the flesh shows us this. Important to remember, however, that distance is the result of our departure and drift from God and not departing and drifting from us. That's why it says, draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Closeness must be initiated by us because God hasn't moved. Didn't the Bible say He's the same yesterday and today and forever? If you don't feel close to God tonight, it's not because God moved, it's because we've drifted. And if you want to get close to God, then it must be initiated by us. And I'll go so far as to say this, I believe the text goes so far as to say this, God requires our move to be the first. You say, Brother Sam, I don't know about that. Doesn't God make a move toward us? I don't know. Did the father make a move toward the prodigal? Or did the prodigal have to make a move toward the father? The father was there. The father was waiting the father was eager, the father was ready, but it wasn't until the repentance of the prodigal that the drawing could commence. And remember, it wasn't the father that ran and fell on the neck of the prodigal until he saw the prodigal a great way off advancing toward him. I, I, I got a great help from that, and I want to change my theology. You say, Brother Sam, a pat, yeah, I'm going to change some theology that I've believed. I used to preach step for step. You take a step toward God, God will take a step towards you. I just don't find it in the book. What I find in the book is the first move is made by the drifted one and then a speedy catching up is made by God. You step toward God, he'll run to you. But he won't run until you make the first move. I wonder if we might be able to take a good old-fashioned Bible word. Now, you won't get this Bible word in these newfangled churches. It's that Bible word, repentance. You know our drift and departure needs to be repented of. And that's what he begins to explain in the next verse. Does he not? He says, draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Now look at the next statement. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Did you know, first of all, cleanse your hands. Sins of the body will cause a distance between you and God. Does not the Bible say if we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us? Did the Bible not say concerning the Jews in the book of Isaiah? Did he not say your sins have separated me from you? Cleanse your hands, James says. You draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. But you've got to get rid of those sins in the flesh. You've got to make them right with God. You've got to put them under the blood. You've got to repent of that tongue. And you've got to repent of that lust. And you've got to repent of that contentious, strifeful, unforgiving attitude. And you've got to repent of not doing that which is right, knowing to do good and doing it not. He said, you 12 tribes... You have some baggage that the world is seeing. You're trying to tell the world that you're a Christian, but there's some sin on the outside. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. You want to get close to God, friend, you've got to repent of the outward sins. 
and cease to do them. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. But then he says, purify your hearts. You can see me. I can see you. But you cannot see my heart. And I cannot see your heart. But God can. Do you not remember Samuel in front of Eliab? Surely the Lord's anointed standeth before me. And God told Samuel, you overlook him. You bypass him altogether. He may look good on the outside, but I know the heart. Man looks on the outside. God looks on the heart. He said the outside is fine. He said, but the inside is rotten. Those are the sins of the heart. You know what that greatest sin would be? I think it's found in Isaiah. Now listen to this. Uh, God had a little issue with the Jews in Isaiah and with the nation of Israel. This was a people that would always talk about how they loved God. The only problem was they didn't love God. They talked about how they honored God, but they didn't honor God. Notice what he said. For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. You don't draw nigh to God with your mouth. Then he says this, and with their lips they do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. The issue tonight, Brother Sam, that person out of church just needs to get back in church. True, but they never will until the heart draws closer to God their problem tonight is not that they've walked out the doors of the church the problem is they've walked away from God in their heart does not the Bible say out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh your actions are betrayed by your heart we can try to hide them for as long as we think we can but eventually what's on the inside will come out and then he says this cleanse your hands ye sinners and purify your heart she double minded that is hypocrisy that's what it means to be double minded it means to say one thing and yet live another and he said you 12 tribes scattered abroad you're saying one thing but your life is not backing up what you're saying and more importantly what you're saying is known by God to be an outright hypocritical lie you are better off to be honest with God and just live like a Christian who wants nothing to do with him although that's a sad state of affairs, than to say, oh, I love you, and live completely opposite of someone who does. I think God's sick and tired of our mouth. And he wants to see some movement out of a heart of love. Are you doing that tonight? Are you declaring you love him, but your heart's far from him? You know, next week's the best conference. Even as a pastor, I, I'm praying that God will keep me from serving in the flesh with not my heart being in it. I've preached that way before. One thing you do after 25 years of preaching, you get used to it. Someone right now in any situation could call me and I could in the flesh fulfill the duty required I'm confident of that I'm not bragging I'm just saying I've done it a long time I'm homiletically ready I'm hermeneutically ready and I'm giving you words that you don't even know just to show you I'm ready but my heart not be in it you can sing in the choir that way you can teach a class that way. You can sit right in that pew that way. You can put your tithe in. You can give to missions. The whole time you're giving to missions, you're saying, I wonder what I could have done with that money. Your heart's far from them. Your heart's far from them. Your heart's far from them in the Word. Your heart's far from them in the prayer closet. Your heart's far from them in church. And eventually where the heart goes, the body goes. The first thing I notice before anyone leaves church, their heart changed. And eventually it just comes out on the outside. 
draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Let me give you this tonight. He then says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. That right there is where God resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. And you could actually take that verse of Scripture and uh, you could correspond it to uh, actually the text of Scripture on the Lord's table. Do you not remember when Paul deals with the Lord's table in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and uh, he follows the pattern of our Lord uh, uh, sup and you, you, you drink the cup and you eat the bread and you show forth his death until he come but he said you can't approach the table with dirty hands and so then what does Paul say God gives him liberty to say now tell them if you'll judge yourself you'll not be judged you know God could fix me and you right now completely involuntarily he could straighten us up and right now. But he said, I'd rather your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. I'd rather you fall under the Psalm 51 version against thee, O God, of I sin and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, clear when thou judgest. Now there's something very important said here. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. Do you remember the psalm? Maybe you have quoted it, memorized it. Maybe you haven't. But remember he says in there, he goes through a whole list. Forgive my transgressions. Purge me with hyssop and I'll be clean. I did this because in sin did my mother conceive me. I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is ever before me. He said thou mightest be clear when thou judgest, clear when you speak. I know you're going to have to deal with this situation. But then he said deliver me from blood guiltiness. Do you know what that means? He's literally saying now I would appreciate it if you'd spare my life. Because even though I'm the king of Israel, I have committed a capital offense against the law of Moses and God. Is that not right? Do you know the law? Was he not in adultery? Did he not murder a man? He's got the capital offense of death penalty twice on his head. No one knew it but God and Nathan, I told my wife one time, I said, the prophet Nathan has really helped me as a pastor. You'd say, Nathan wasn't a pastor. Well, he gave me some piece of advice and he never opened his mouth. There was one man in the entire kingdom that could have blown the lid off the whole thing. But he said, that's not my place. That's God's place. And there are times that I see in my own life, I see in the life of the sheep things that should probably be dealt with. And the Holy Spirit says, I think I'll do better at it than you. I said, I believe you will. Now, why wasn't David executed at the hand of God? And why of all... Can I ask you a question? Will you compare the sin of Saul and the sin of David? Will you do that with me? And then tell me how one lost his kingdom and one gets the Christ child through his heritage? Now, I'm sorry. I love David. But to murder a man, to take his wife, seems a whole lot more than not sacrificing all the sheep. What was the difference? One was small in his own eyes, and one refused to be small. Did he not say that to Saul? Saul, there was a time you were small and now you're large and there's no evidence. Take your Bible and show me where Saul repented. Only thing he did was fell on Samuel and rent his garment and say, Samuel said, I'm not sacrificing, but you have to sacrifice. He said, I'm not sacrificing and he rent his garment. If you remember, he lunged at him and he rent his garment and he said, and this is why he was going to sacrifice. The people will know. Do you not remember that? 
You have to sacrifice with me to save my face. No wonder he lost his kingdom and his life and his son and his grandson becomes a cripple living in Lodibar and his enemy ends up taking care of him. To a man like David, what happened, Brother Sam? One judged himself, so God took his hand off of him. He did judge him. He paid fourfold, didn't he not? He lost his baby, and he lost Absalom, and his son raped his daughter. A lot happened in the life, and then Absalom murdered Amnon. Oh yeah, uh, there was judgment in the life of David, but he was delivered from blood guiltiness. Why? Humble yourself and God will lift you up. He'll fix it. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I'm going to close with this. We treat our walk with God with such a cavalier attitude. Always expecting Him to be there. But God's not like some of our friends. I have them. I don't know if you do. I've got friends that I'll text and talk with when they need me, and then when they don't need me, they don't talk with me. That includes preacher friends. And that's the way we treat God. I just got laid off. I'm in the hospital. I need money. I'm sick. My child's wayward. Oh, God, let me run to you. Isn't it amazing we run to him when we need him, but we don't walk with him just for the sake of the fact that he saved us, redeemed us, and gave us a home in heaven and made us a part of his family? The whole title of the message, and I give it to you at the end, is you're as close as you care to be. To a Wednesday night crowd, you may be sitting in a pew but far, far, far from him. One day you're going to go looking for him. You're not going to find him there because our hands got dirty and our heart got wicked. God, where are you? Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. What's the point of the message tonight, Brother Sam? The point of the Bible study is stay close. And don't you dare look at anyone else and blame your walk with God on anybody. You don't blame it on your parents. You don't blame it on your spouse. You don't blame it on the pastor. I don't blame it on the people. Don't blame it on Biden. You can blame inflation and you can blame circumstances on Biden but you cannot blame your response and walk with God on Biden well it's Biden's fault he made me cranky by the state of our government no you're cranky because you've drifted from God excuse me some of the happiest people in all the word of God served under rotten leaders why they knew the source of their joy and where their heart belonged Don't let a bad economy, Vladimir Putin, woke liberals, take the joy out of your heart. You walk with God. Sam Davison was preaching, and, and I love Brother Sam. He's going to be here next year for our revival. I don't know how I got him, but every other year I got him. And, and he was preaching, and uh, he said, I'm sick and tired of Christians saying, well, Brother Sam, you just don't know how hard it is to walk with God. I work all day, I get up early, I go to bed late, I got parents to take care of, I've got kids to take care of in school, I've got a job to work, to which Brother Sam finally said, be quiet. The problem isn't you have too many things keeping you away from God, the problem is you don't want to get near God. So you allow the things to keep you away. He said, why don't you just, and I love how he did this, you know how Brother Sam uses it, he said, cut out a spot. And spend some time with God. Boy, I felt the Holy felt the Holy Spirit say, that goes for you too there, bud. 
you, I'm just, can I confess my fault to you? Do you know who probably has an easier time of being a hypocrite in this church than you? And that's me. Because I spend my life in this. Other than her, and I'm even more than her, no one's in this building as much as I am. No one. I spend my life in the Bible. That's my calling. I spend my life studying. You know how easy it is to just go through the motions and just get us, if I'm not careful. I, I, and if you're not careful, you know these songs, you'll get right up in that choir, and eventually the Landmark Baptist Church is going to go, it, we just feel so distant, something's not right. Yeah, because you let God walk out the back door. He said, well, if your heart's not with me, then why am I with you? And then we find ourselves in Revelation. He's standing at the door. Oh, can I get back in? Yeah, you draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Brother Joe, if you'll come, let's have a hymn of invitation. You're as close tonight as you care to be. I'm going to close with a quote that Harry Ironside made as I was studying him his commentary today he said he is ever ready to reach out the hand of help when we come to the end of ourselves so tonight you'll allow pride to keep you distant or you'll allow humility to draw you close let's stand together brother Joe just start to play something please whatever is on your heart has God spoken to you tonight? You're as close as you care to be. You're as close as you care to be. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. 